Hey everybody, got a special video for you today. I, you may not know this, love trees. They're tall and they're skinny just like me, and they do so much for us, from making oxygen so we can breathe, to cooling urban environments with their shade, to literally holding the ground together to prevent erosion. So, when we here at SciShow heard that Mr. Beast and Mark Rober were assembling a team of tree lovers to help them plant 20 million trees by the end of 2019, we were all in. Everybody on the SciShow team agreed we are hashtag Team Trees and we want you to join us. For every dollar you donate at TeamTrees.org, the Arbor Day Foundation will plant a tree. The goal is to get to 20 million by December 31st. And we've put together this compilation of our favorite tree episodes to inspire you to donate. So kick back, enjoy the show, and be sure to head to TeamTrees.org afterwards to help us plant trees. First up, we're going to talk about what is arguably the most delicious tree out there, avocado trees. Don't eat the tree part, though. But who doesn't love their tasty green fruit mashed and spread on a piece of toast? But it turns out, it is a bit of a miracle that avocados are still around. We very nearly lived in a world without them. Here's Michael to explain their almost tragic fate. Whether it's sliced on top of a salad, tucked in a California sushi roll, or mashed as guacamole in a burrito, people seem to love avocados. In fact, people in the United States munched through 4 billion of them in 2014 alone. They taste great, they're good for you, but one of the most amazing things about avocados is that they still exist. See, they had a special relationship with huge beasts that lumbered around Central America tens of thousands of years ago. And when these animals went extinct, avocados could easily have gone down with them. But, luckily for us, they were saved by some prehistoric farmers. The word avocado comes from the Aztecs, specifically the Nahuatl word aguacatl, which means testicle. I mean, you can kind of see where they got the name. It probably has something to do with the, uh, you know, the shape and texture of avocados, the way they hang from trees. Anyway, before they became popular in the rest of the world, they were cultivated in Mesoamerica for thousands of years. Avocados are a fruit, basically swollen plant ovaries, but nutritionally, they're very different from other fruits you'd find at the supermarket. Fruits like apples and oranges are composed mostly of water and sugar. And in general, fruit is probably better for you than, say, a bag of sweets or a sugary drink because it contains fiber, which slows down the sugar absorption and makes you feel fuller faster. By comparison, avocados have much less sugar, but more protein and fat. That gives them that smooth, creamy texture, but it also puts them on the calorific side, for a fruit, anyway. They also contain high levels of potassium and folate nutrients, as well as vitamins C, E, and K. And technically, avocados are berries, like grapes and blueberries. Rather than holding lots of little seeds, the avocado goes all in on one big seed, that massive ball at the core of each fruit. And avocados, with their huge seeds, evolved alongside equally huge guts. Tens of thousands of years ago, during the Pleistocene Epoch, a menagerie of megafauna, or giant animals, roamed the Americas. While woolly mammoths chilled out in the north, ground sloths weighing three tons and armadillos the size of cars lived in the warm equatorial forests. These giant sloths and armadillos ate a lot of avocados. Their digestive systems would break down the tough skin and absorb the high energy pulp. Then the indigestible seed, which contains bitter toxins that kept the animal from chewing it up, passed right out the other end. The animals got a tasty meal, and the avocado trees got to scatter their offspring throughout the Mesoamerican forests. Plus, the seeds got some nice warm fertilizer to give them a nutritious boost. And with these megafauna around to eat the fruit, avocado trees trees could keep growing berries with increasingly massive seeds. The bigger the seed, the more nutrients could be stored inside as a starter kit for the baby tree. This is especially useful in dense tropical forests where canopies of older trees block out much of the light for the saplings below. So instead of depending entirely on sunlight for energy, the avocado seedlings could supplement photosynthesis with the nutrients in their seed to survive. This happy evolutionary match didn't last, though. Eventually, the megafauna suffered a mass extinction around 10 to 13,000 years ago. We don't know exactly why, but scientists think the warming climate at the end of the last ice age was partly responsible. Though, it was also suspiciously close to the time humans began spreading across the Americas, no doubt enjoying lots of giant mammal meat along the way. This meant avocados were in trouble. Without their large gutted evolutionary partners, the trees stopped thriving, their fruit fell to the ground, and the seeds mostly just became food for mold. But more hungry creatures were nearby. The new human arrivals loved the avocado's flesh as much as the ground sloths did. They also had the tools to eat them, and the brains to figure out how to grow them. Avocados were all set for domestication. The avocados we eat today are probably a little different than the ones that grew tens of thousands of years ago. For example, thanks to artificial selection, they probably have more pulp than their ancestors. But they've kept their huge seeds, ready and waiting for the guts of long-dead beasts.
So we're lucky that thousands of years ago, some farmers decided to plant a bunch of avocado trees. And hey, I bet that thousands of years from now, our descendants will be pretty happy if we plant a whole bunch of trees, too. So don't forget to go to teamtrees.org after this episode to help us plant 20 million trees. And speaking of planting trees, avocados aren't the only tree whose fate is in our hands. The American chestnut is also struggling to survive our modern world world, though that's because of a deadly fungus, not the lack of seed spreaders. It's time for Olivia to explain. Picture a forest full of gigantic trees soaring 30 meters into the sky with five meter wide trunks. You probably envisioned something like the giant sequoias and redwoods that grow on the western coast of the United States. But a little over a century ago, the east coast of America was also home to giant trees. Though somewhat smaller than their western counterparts, American chestnuts were huge, and they were all over the eastern U.S. at the dawn of the 20th century. Then, within a few decades, they were almost extinct. The culprit? a fungus that strangled the trees from within, brought by accident from Asia. Since their demise, scientists have been trying to figure out if there's a way to bring the American chestnut back. And thanks to technological advances, they may finally have a solution, if they can convince the government to let them plant genetically modified trees. To understand what happened to the American chestnut, we have to go back in time to the end of the 19th century. Back then, American chestnut trees were known as the sequoias of the East because they had huge trunks and were tall like the West Coast giants, and they were all over. In 1900, around a quarter of the hardwood trees east of the Mississippi were American chestnuts. In some places, they made up as much as 40% of the forest. But by the 1940s, they were all but gone. The first signs of trouble were seen in the Bronx Zoo in 1904, when sores called cankers were discovered on a stand of dying trees. Scientists soon realized that the disease was widespread, and by 1912, botanists had managed to identify both the fungus responsible and its point of origin. The chestnut blight fungus gets under the tree's bark by hitching a ride on insects. The fungus then attacks and feeds off of the tree's water-transmitting cambium tissues, essentially choking the tree. The blight fungus probably arrived in New England in the 1870s when Japanese chestnut trees became popular ornamental plants. The imports are resistant to the blight, so it's likely they carried it to America where the chestnut trees were totally susceptible. And by the 1940s, it's estimated that nearly 4 billion trees had died. But they didn't go extinct entirely. A few scattered populations still exist, mostly trees that people planted outside of their original range. There are also smaller specimens along the East Coast that were isolated enough from their kin to avoid infection. And it turns out that, like the Dread Pirate Roberts, even the dead trees are only mostly dead. While the blight destroyed their trunks, their root systems remained. And even decades later, these living stumps occasionally eke out a shoot of new growth. But it's usually in vain, because the blight is still around. Although it isn't doing much damage to them, it's still lurking in oaks that took over after the chestnuts were wiped out. So before any chestnut shoots can reach reproductive maturity, they catch the blight. But where there's growth, there's hope. So scientists have been trying to figure out a way to bring American chestnuts back to their former glory. Since the 1980s, forestry specialists and geneticists have tried all sorts of things to make blight-resistant trees. They attempted a technique called backcrossing, for example where surviving specimens and their offspring were carefully bred together to select for natural resistance genes. But while this method seems to work for European chestnuts, it hasn't worked as well with the American ones, probably because the European ones were more resistant to begin with. Researchers have also tried hybridizing American chestnuts with blight-resistant Chinese chestnuts, but so far, they haven't been able to get the resistance traits to reliably pass down from generation to generation. But one method that does seem to work is genetically modifying the trees. It turns out that wheat rust, a fungal disease of wheat, has a similar mechanism of infection to chestnut blight. Both use a compound called oxalic acid to soften up important structural tissues, while also attacking their host cambium by stimulating the growth of calcium oxalate crystals, blocking the flow of nutrients. Resistant forms of wheat produce an enzyme called oxalate oxidase, which breaks down the acid, thereby blocking the dispersal of the disease and preventing the growth of those crystals. Scientists have introduced this wheat gene into American chestnuts, and in 2014, they revealed that they produced a 100% resistant tree that passed that trait onto its offspring. Success. But the trees haven't been planted yet. The researchers have conducted some preliminary studies to show the trees don't cause any unexpected harm to the organisms that live in the environments that they once inhabited. And then they requested permission from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to release the transgenic trees into the wild. 
but they're still waiting for the green light. And that could take a while, if it's ever granted at all. Aside from the general anxiety that accompanies the development of any GMO, some ecologists worry that a return of the American chestnut would disrupt a century-old ecosystem that's developed without it. On the other hand, if successfully put in action, this method could also work for restoring other wild tree populations beleaguered by fungal invasives, like elm trees. I guess only time will tell if the sequoia of the East will once again stand tall. It's really sad that billions of chestnuts just died so suddenly. Even today, we're losing trees at an alarming rate, which is why it's more important than ever to plant more. And you can help us do that if you go to teamtrees.org after this episode. It would be a shame if we didn't have all the wonderful weird trees we have today, like, for example, the ones in Europe's dancing forests. Oh, look, it's a younger version of me here with the deets on those. The dancing forest of Kaliningrad is exactly the kind of place where you'd expect to find a werewolf creeping through the mist. Located in a place called the Koronian Spit off the Baltic Sea on the border of Russia and Lithuania, the strange forest is known to locals by a jollier name, the Drunken Forest. Because, well, the stand of pine trees looks more than a little schnockered as they twist and curve, stretching upward in contorted loops to find their way to the sky. And here's the thing, no one knows why these trees look like they're grinding to Marvin Gaye. Of course, theories abound, some suggesting unstable soil is the cause, or beetle damage, or even nuclear radiation. Local legends say that crawling through one of these tree loops in the right direction will earn you an extra year of life. A more popular, non-magical theory suggests powerful winds were the original shaping force. And there is a precedent for that. If you've ever hiked into an alpine zone forest, you've probably seen patches of stunted, twisted, super cool mini trees called crumholtz. They get so thoroughly clobbered by harsh, cold winds that they end up growing more horizontal than vertical. But some people think that the trees in the dancing forest have been trained to grow that way. Humans have long been manipulating trees for commercial or aesthetic purposes. And Mr. Miyagi and his bonsais, he was all about tree shaping. Humans can train a young tree to grow in unconventional ways by laying a heavy object on its skinny trunk, sometimes for years. The tree, just like the house plant in your windowsill, wants to grow toward the sun really bad, and no weight is going to stop it from reaching the light a process called phototropism. And whether plants are made to bend intentionally or not, the effects of phototropism can change the character of its tissues. In trees, the wood that forms under the pressure of weight is called reaction wood, or in conifers, compression wood. It's created when the layer of tissue beneath the bark called the cambium thickens below the source of the pressure to support the horizontal weight of the tree. In time, the funny shape of the bend becomes permanent, and it leaves behind a record of oval or oblong instead of more circular rings. In the case of the dancing forest, local history historians have no recollection of any human manipulation to create this effect, but there is another forest in northwest Poland called the Crooked Forest, made of about 400 pine trees that all have uniform 90-degree bends at the base of their trunks. The trees are all the same age, and they all bend north. Because of this uniformity, many people believe that this forest was manipulated by humans, perhaps to grow uniquely shaped wood for oxen yokes, ship hulls, or for furniture making. That particular theory maintains that the trees were shaped before 1930, but were abandoned before they could be harvested with the outbreak of World War II. But ultimately, even the cause of the crooked forest's odd tree shapes remains a mystery, and they could also be attributed to some powerful force like strong winds, heavy snow and ice pack, or even the result of one of my favorite theories being run over by Nazi tanks as young trees during the war. And you know, all this reminds us that while scientific explanations of natural phenomena are usually pretty cool and often necessary, sometimes it's maybe a little bit cooler for it just to be a mystery. Oh, those twisty trees are very cool. You know what else would be cool if Team Trees successfully plants 20 million trees in the next two months? You know you want to be a part of that, and you can be if you go to teamtrees.org to donate. And speaking of cool things, it's fall here in the Northern Hemisphere, which means the temperature is falling, and leafy trees are painting the landscape with beautiful yellows, oranges, and reds. If you've ever wondered why that happens, well, wonder no more. Michael's got the skinny on autumn leaves.
The changing leaves of autumn are really awesome to look at, but they're also a really striking example of nature taking extreme measures to protect itself. You're probably familiar with photosynthesis. It's the process plants use to turn carbon dioxide, water, and light energy into sugars and oxygen. And you probably also know that photosynthesis depends on a pigment, a colored compound called chlorophyll. But you may not realize that plants contain lots of other pigments as well. Some of the most important are the carotenoids, yellow, orange, and brown pigments that give color to things like corn, carrots, pumpkins, and sweet potatoes, and and the anthocyanins, which give red and purple color to cherries, berries, pomegranates, and red apples, to name a few. All of these pigments play an important role in the plant's functions, but there's usually far more chlorophyll in a plant than anything else because photosynthesis is a plant's number one job. However, many trees are less active in the winter because they grow at northern and southern latitudes that get less sunlight during those months. These trees are called deciduous, from the Latin word that means to fall off. Since deciduous trees don't do much photosynthesis in the winter, it doesn't really make sense to spend a bunch of energy maintaining big green leaves. So when the days get shorter and the temperature gets cooler, they send less of their limited resources to the leaves and start using what water and nutrients they have to keep the rest of the tree alive. The chlorophyll in the leaves breaks down and the green color gradually goes away. And when that happens, the other pigments, which were there all the time, are better able to show off their colors before the leaves die entirely and fall off the tree. So the leaves aren't actually changing pigments, they're just losing their strong green pigment to reveal the other colors in the tissue. After the tree stops supply of food and water to the leaves, all that's left is for the tree to cut them off. The tree forms a special layer of weakly bound cells near the base of the leaf's stalk. Then another layer of cells at the very bottom of the stalk expands to push the leaf away. Eventually, the leaf can be knocked off easily, even by a light wind. And then, it's your job to rake them up. It's pretty weird when you think about it that deciduous trees just discard huge chunks of themselves every year to make it through to spring. It's just like, eh. I don't need these hands anymore. I'll grow new ones in a few months. So here's a really young me to talk about the oldest trees in the world. Well, when you start talking about the oldest or biggest or almost any other superlative in nature, you're unlikely to find a cut and dry answer. There are in fact two contenders for oldest tree, and it depends on how you define the term. The oldest known individual tree was discovered in 2012 in the White Mountains of East Central California, a great northern bristlecone pine that's 5,063 years old. That's older than the pyramids. Here's a photo of a similar bristlecone pine. Now, it doesn't look exactly alive, and that may be part of its secret to success. The high, cold, arid climate of the White Mountains turns out to be the perfect environment for fostering these ancient trees. Strangely, the higher you go in those mountains, the older the trees get, and several studies have suggested that the longevity of pines there is directly related to how bad the growing conditions are. Not only is the average rainfall in the White Mountains less than 30 centimeters per year, but most of the trees are growing growing on dolomite, a type of limestone in highly alkaline soil with very few nutrients. But over time, bristle cones have adapted to this alkalinity, unlike other trees, which has left them free to grow without much, if any, competition. Bristle cones also don't expend a lot of energy on their growth. In a good year, the tree's girth will increase by about 0.25 millimeters, so instead, they can make the most of their meager resources. As a result, bristle cones tend to have a pretty high proportion of dead to live wood, but this has its advantages too, reducing respiration and water loss. And it also helps that there aren't many other trees around, which makes it less likely that they'll fall victim to a forest fire over the millennia. Researchers are able to determine these trees' precise age thanks to a process called cross-dating, which involves taking core samples from both living and dead trees, and then matching up the patterns of their rings to come back with a timeline that goes back thousands of years. For our second contender, we're going to Fish Lake National Forest in south-central Utah. Here lives a clonal colony of quaking aspen that may very well be the oldest living thing on Earth. It's been named Pando, and every tree or stem, as they're called, in the half-square kilometer colony is genetically identical. Although no individual tree in the colony is older than 200 years, they're all connected by a single root system that's at least 80,000 years old, and possibly much older. At over 6,000 metric tons, it also holds the distinction of being the heaviest known living organism on Earth. So, how did Pando get so old? Clonal colonies like Pando can reproduce either by flowering and producing seeds, or by producing a clone of themselves. In this case, cloning just means extending the enormous network of roots and forcing a new stem up through the ground. Because the heart of Pando is so far beneath the ground, it can't be killed by a forest fire. Recent studies have found that Pando hasn't reproduced sexually in more than 10,000 years. 
that's quite a dry spell. And not that surprising, given its age. That just means that it's up to the root system to continue producing clones and letting forest fires burn to keep invading conifers at bay. So thanks for the evolutionary tips, world's oldest trees. I'll be sure to keep them in mind when I turn 5,000 years old and want to go for another 5,000. 80,000 years! Just imagine what Pando has witnessed in its lifetime. It must feel like every new clone tree grows into a totally different world. And it's not just Pando, of course. Lots of trees can live for centuries, if not millennia. Trees planted today could last long after you and I are gone. They'll be witness to the future we're creating with the choices we make. So let's make good choices for them and for us. By planting trees, we can make the world a better place in all sorts of ways. So I hope you'll join us. You can be part of Team Trees by donating at teamtrees.org. Every dollar donated plants a tree, thanks to the Arbor Day Foundation.